Well, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming back to the Top of the Hilltop for our continuing series discussion presidents and presidential history and American history in all its facets. Thank you for putting up as well for our short delay this afternoon in starting up. It turns out uh, we are actually broadcasting live on two different platforms right now because this was such a popular event. Uh, well, one wouldn't handle it. So thanks to our technical team for getting that going. And I look forward to what's going to be a really exciting discussion tonight of a couple of historians, three and talking about the presidential election coming up, which I'm sure you've, you've heard about. Before we do that, let me just pivot one quick moment to remind you about our new podcast, looking at the history of presidents and race. We are, boy, we've got five episodes up right now. And uh, actually, you have been very nice in following my instructions and uh, going on and downloading and perhaps even liking because uh, it's getting some nice reviews. Keep that up. Uh, but we are entering the 20th century very soon. And so I encourage you to please, please uh, jump on that podcast. And to be honest, both of our uh, discussions tonight are going to make future appearances. So I think that's something extra special to look forward to. Uh, without any further ado, then let's get to our discussion tonight, a discussion between uh, political historians. We have two professors from Princeton University, Kevin Cruz and Julian Zelzer. Uh, both are among the top, top few top handful of political historians working in America today. Uh, Kevin, you can find uh, everywhere on Twitter for sure. Julian, you can find on CNN together. They've really written on any number of topics. In fact, in the entire panoply, if you will, of American history topics from race to civil rights to American foreign policy. Uh, they even authored a book together from the 1970s on forward. So there's really nobody better than these two gentlemen to discuss really what's going on today in broader historical context. And so without further ado, what we're gonna do is invite uh, first Kevin, then Julian in to give a few moments of introductory remarks and then open up for broad discussion. And please let me remind you that you can offer your question in the Q&A section at the very bottom of your uh, webinar uh, screen. And more important, perhaps, you can actually, um, you know, have some influence here and like other people's questions and now pop it up the queue. So I'll know to ask that in particular. So now, genuinely, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Professor Kevin Cruz uh, from Princeton University, author of uh, books on Atlanta, uh, author of book and race. But I think more importantly for tonight, uh, Kansas City Chiefs fan. So thank you in particular, Kevin, for being willing to be on this broadcast while the Chiefs are playing. Uh, and I assure you that we are going to be texting you uh, only that they scored, nothing beyond that. So Kevin, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and again, it is a sign of how much uh, I admire uh, Jeff Engel and the entire SMU crew uh, that I am doing this during a Chiefs game. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, I'm a long suffering fan. They're finally fun to watch. So, uh, but, uh, but it's always a delight to be at least virtually with, uh, uh the folks at SMU. Uh, I, I love, I love, uh, heading there for talks. We, uh, Julie and I were both, uh, uh saddened when, uh, this trip, this talk was originally plan, uh, planned for the spring. Um, we had to cancel it. Uh, the people at SMU are amazing. The food down there is somehow even better. I'm a native Southerner. Uh, up north, so um, uh, that was tragic. Uh, but we're both excited to be here today uh, to talk to you all about uh, the election. As Jeff said, uh, Julian and I wrote a book together called Fault Lines, uh, A History of the United States Since 1974, uh, which covered a number of very consequential presidential elections uh, in the modern era. Uh, we've uh, uh, worked on, on past ones before that, on countless edited collections, on our own individual work. Uh, so we're happy to really talk about anything. Um, uh, we don't really have much in the way of, at least I don't, in terms of formal uh, opening comments to make. Really interested in this being a true conversation. Uh, so if you've got questions about uh, uh, this presidential election or past ones, uh, uh, feel free to ask them. Uh, everyone always wants us to make predictions. Happy to try, but I will remind you uh, professionally uh, that our training is in hindsight. Uh, and so you're, you're taking a bit of a risk and asking us to make predictions about what will come uh, in the future. Uh, but happy to chat about uh, whatever y'all would like. So I'll turn it over to Julian. 
Hi there, everyone. Um, it's nice, nice to be with all of you. And uh, I think Kevin and I both agree we'd rather uh, be able to be there enjoying all of your company and food. Um, but we're still glad that we are able to do this. Jeff, thank you uh, for putting this event together. And uh, I want to kind of move to the discussion, but I was just thinking a little bit when, when we uh, put the book Fault Lines out, this was long before the pandemic. And it's been, people asked us uh, many times, what would test the fault lines? Could anything break the fault lines? And I think I, I can't speak for Kevin, but it's been pretty remarkable to watch them play out even in the middle of a global crisis like this that the nation has faced. And I think the question is what does that have to do with the election? And uh, does the election break some of the patterns that we have seen? Is it ultimately an election like 1964, uh, where you have a landslide uh, victory, something not for the incumbent this time, which in 64 was Lyndon Johnson, but instead uh, for Joe Biden uh, and, and the opposition? Is it like 2000? where you have a very narrow election that turns into a partisan brawl and is contested and challenged legally? Uh, or is it like 2004 when the incumbent manages to pull off a, a victory using wedge issues in particular, uh, even though there was a lot of the population uh, that clearly didn't like him? Uh, so let's have the discussion and let's turn on, turn on the cameras and I'm looking forward to it. Okay, uh, let's get to it. Um, you can thank me later, Julian, for not bringing up uh, which football team we support. Uh, it's not worth it, people, trust me. Uh, so let me hit you guys with the big historian question, sort of the softball that's out there. When you think about the 2020 election as it appears to be shaping up to your eyes, what election so far does it remind you most of? Uh, you know, Julian, you mentioned a couple of different electoral outcomes, but as we're in the run-up, does this strike you as what year? Yeah, look, I mean, I don't know the outcomes. I can't tell you the exact answer. And like Kevin said, our, our trainings in the past, although I think everyone who makes predictions pretty much is in the same boat, but it does, look, there's a lot of 2000 already in it. 2000 took place in this contemporary era that we are in. Uh, incredible levels of polarization. The election was close, which I could imagine it still being. Uh, and in that case, the political and legal apparatus to challenge recounts, to challenge voting, kicked into high gear through uh, Bush's campaign. And I think it's a little different in that now a lot of this is taking place ahead of time. Uh, and, and we're not even waiting for actual election day to see that happening. But but that election, I, I think, can be very indicative of how this might unfold. Even the, the final thing, kind of gamesmanship with the media and, and how you call the election. It was very important in 2000 that the Bush team presented it as a victory. This was part of the strategy and that uh, Gore was challenging the victory. And I think that's going to be part of the contest in this election. How do you frame what happens now on Election Day and in the weeks that follow? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. I think 2000 is definitely a, a limited view. In a little way, you know, there, there's no one-to-one -one comparison. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, most of the 2000 election, it actually looked not like this one at all. It was a race to the middle. You know, uh, Bush and Gore were both fighting over who could basically maintain the economic prosperity of the 1990s. And both of them kind of sidelined the fringes of, of each of their parties. You know, uh, Bush's compassionate conservatism was a sign he wasn't going to be like the Gingrich Republicans. Uh, Gore didn't want Clinton campaigning with them because he didn't want the Lewinsky scandal handing over them. So they both kind of moved to the middle. But then w the recount, it certainly uh, uh, entered into a period that I think Julian's absolutely right. We're living in before the election somehow. The kind of the, there's a lot of talk about litigation. There's a lot of talk about the election ending up in the Supreme Court, which. I'm going to say this until I go hoarse, is not where a presidential election is supposed to be decided. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of rules in place. Uh, there's a document called the Constitution, uh, which lays out a lot of this stuff in detail, and it goes through Congress. It doesn't go to the Supreme Court. Um, so 2000, I think, is certainly a in view. 
Uh, Julian said it could be a, a landslide like uh, uh, like 64 the other way. I guess if it's like that, and then we'll be talking about, you know, the comparisons to 1980, when you had an incumbent president who, uh, you know, uh, kind of was uh, voted out in a referendum election uh, on his uh, on his presidency and, uh, and a new era came in. Uh, should Biden win? And should there be a big uh, blue sweep? Uh, if that's, that's one of the scenarios we're talking about, certainly not a lock at this point. Uh, then I think you could see something like a kind of repeat of the Reagan revolution, uh, but on the on the left here. Well, so uh, let me throw a hypothesis at you guys uh, and you give me your reaction. And truth in advertising, uh, and this is also advertising, uh, we just did our podcast today on William McKinley and I interviewed Daniel Imawar from uh, Northwestern mm. University. And he and I were batting around the comparison between 1896 and this election. Uh, obviously you have in many ways, you know, if you look back in 2016, at least a regional split, uh, you have uh, inequality being one of the issues on the campaign. You have you know, one campaign that's in essence saying we need to go back, back to the past, go back to the future. Um, and uh, you also have one that is, if you will, pro international business and cosmopolitanism and one that is anti-religious and anti-science uh, mm -hmm. in many ways and a populist revolt against a cosmopolitan uh, elite. Uh, what strikes me, I'll get to the question in a second, what strikes me about this comparison is that if you lay things out that way, then 2016 in many ways appears to be the anomaly that 1896 uh, played out differently in 2016 and the person who was behind the demographic wave lost, or excuse me, won. Um, First of all, what do you think of that comparison? But second of all, if that hypothesis is true, does that suggest that 2020 will be the same as 1896 or 1900 in establishing a very set electoral system that will frankly stay in place for decades unless one party chooses to, to implode? That was a long-winded question. That was a, that was a, uh, yeah, uh, we're out of time, we're done. <laughs> um, I mean, look, I mean, Part of me wants to try to workshop a William Jennings Bryan cross a gold Donald Trump hotel a gold joke, uh, but <laughs> I'll 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 leave that to the side. I mean, you know, we could be talking about the creation of a new party system, uh, like you had after 1896 and 1932, and on and on. Um, uh, again, that that that's going to be tough to tell off the off the top. I, I think the the key there, though, obviously, is what happens. We always fixate on the presidential. Part of this equation naturally it looms large but those real change elections those the kind of the start of the new party systems really come into place when you have down ballot wins uh and especially in the house and the senate so uh the signs are there that it could happen um we certainly saw the start of this in 2018 uh could be leading up to a to kind of a new shift uh, certainly the demographic movement uh has been the same if we start to see democrats crack the south uh, uh, in, in, in some more meaningful way, Obama certainly had a kind of lead in. Uh, we could we could see that, yeah. It could happen. I, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, the institutional uh, support that the Republican Party has is still pretty formidable. Um, whether you're talking about the Electoral College or pretty sophisticated gerrymandering. There's parts of the electorate that it might be a one-off if President Trump loses in some of these regions. I'm not totally convinced yet that if Biden wins in some of these states, that that means in uh, 2024, Democrats would continue to have that. We, we, you know, we haven't had, I mean, even the idea of realignments is challenged now as being the best way to describe some of these elections, critical elections, but we haven't had that kind of election uh, for a while. And part of it's because there's just not a lot of movement in the electorate. Uh, and part of it are these other dynamics in politics like the Electoral College, which still uh, benefit uh, the Republicans. And, and I don't know what will happen in Congress. Um, you know, even if let's remember the Republicans lose control of the Senate, I don't think it will be by the margins that disempower um, Mitch McConnell. So if you're not talking about getting rid of the filibuster, which I don't think is a done deal, he'll still be pretty influential in supporting his agenda uh, or the Republican agenda. And let's remember, we now have a 6-3 conservative block on the Supreme Court, or we will 
uh, inevitably very soon. And, and that's yet another part of government uh, in addition to the rest of the federal courts, which is gonna be hard for a new democratic year to gain hold. So, so I can see it, uh, but I think we should also kind of be a little sober on, on, on how this might play out and some of the constraints on the democratic party. Well, and, and, and to your point about this perhaps being uh, anomalous in some ways, I mean, I, I think it's remarkable as we look at the polls that they've been incredibly stable basically since, since January, since March. Uh, and certainly nothing has changed them in the last four or five months. And so my question is, you know, is there any comparison that you guys can think of from American history for an incumbent being this far down uh, before the election? Now, obviously I'm gonna put the caveat out there before you have to, that we didn't have good polling data throughout the bulk of the country's history, but uh, Herbert Hoover comes to mind perhaps uh, but I'm hard pressed to think of another candidate who's, you know, dealing with a recession and personal unpopularity and a pandemic at the same time. Is there anything that leaps to mind as a comparison for you guys? I mean, I, mean, I, don't, I, I, think, I don't think. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, I don't think there's a there's a one to one comparison here. I mean, uh, the, the, yeah. the point I've made in the past is that you certainly see bits of this moment before. If you're looking for a counterpart to any one of those components, we certainly have it, right? We have Hoover and the economic issue. We have uh, the, the, not Wilson, but the Democrats trying to, to maintain power in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, personal unpopularity, yeah, we've had lots of those as well, uh, but we've never had them all at one time. And, and in a reference that will hit with Julian and Jeff and maybe miss everyone else, it, it feels like disaster Voltron. It's all of these uh, little pieces that have come together to form one super disaster. And that's what uh, uh, Trump is wrestling with here. Um, uh, remarkably though, I think a sign of just how much more polarized and partisan we are is that the floor underneath Trump is still there, right? He's still got, depending on the poll, you know, 40 something percent of, about, which is remarkable. You know, any other president, you would have seen that public support crater. There are people who are, locked in with Trump um, and, and and literally he can do no wrong. His his joke about shooting someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue is I think something fairly true that, that he could do, there could be nothing he could do to shed support. I mean, we've got almost a quarter million dead from COVID on his watch and there's a certain contingent out there that is willing to not only give him a pass for this but actually insist he's done a good job with this, right? I think that that's how far gone uh, uh, things are. So so that's what really sticks out to me is not that he's dealing with all these uh, issues which are uh, on their own kind of horrible, taken together, amazing. But even in the face of that, and I think not because of his performance, just because of the way in which the numbers are hard baked, he's still got a solid base of support. Yeah, I'd say um, when I when you said, Jeff, about the numbers being remarkably steady, I actually thought you were going to talk about his floor that even after this pandemic that has just totally, you know, devastated so much of the country, it still is. And it's the people who've passed away, the people who are sick, the people who are living in, you know, broken or fragile institutions is Flora supports where it was when it started. And I don't know, as a historian, that's when you shake your head and like, wow, uh, there's something pretty profound going on there. I mean, the only other comparison to that I can make Jeff, our, our New York Jet fans who are loyal to their team, <laughs> despite their performance. Um, I'm, and I'm, I'd jump, say, look, I'm jumping I, off. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'd say, look, I'd say he is clearly, I, Kevin and I agree. I mean, he he's in Herbert Hoover. He's in uh, Jimmy Carter, George H.W. Bush territory, even worse in many ways in terms of his approval ratings and where he is in the national polls. But he has three things that I think should be taken seriously going into the next few weeks. One is this passionate support uh, in parts of the Republican Party, significant parts of the Republican Party, which matters for registration, which is upticking for Republicans in certain key states right now. And for that turnout uh, on actual election day, it will matter. Uh, and, and it's unclear if Joe Biden can break that. Um, we're going we're to see, but the passion is strong. The support is strong. He has done everything possible to test partisan loyalty. It's like he's a social science test and, and he's proven the polarization thesis is pretty good. Um, two, 
we're seeing real questions about voting, uh, whether it's voting restrictions that are formally on the books in certain states, whether it's questions about how will the pandemic affect election day with poll, uh, polling places, with processing of absentee ballots. We, we don't know. And, and we have seen that this administration is willing to go pretty far in trying to challenge that. And they will do that after the election, certainly if this is close. And finally, uh, and, and it's still significant, the, the ability to put out disinformation is pretty strong. We have now learned that if you didn't know that before the Trump presidency, you see where our information commons is gone. And he still has a few weeks. It's not working so far, but he can certainly pump the public with all kinds of chaotic and uh, misleading messages about Biden. And, and we have to see what that does. So, so I think he's an incumbent who's struggling for sure. And, and the only way to ignore that is to ignore the numbers completely. But there's these other uh, weapons, assets, whatever you want to say, that I still think he's going to bring to the table on election day. So let me turn to the questions that have been flowing in from, from our friends, uh, including uh, the number one question trending uh, thus far is from my good friend Ann Battenberg, uh, who I believe is in the last home stretch of her service as a faculty residence advisor. So thank you for your service. Uh, Ann writes, please talk about the rise of this fringe far right, right wing caucus. What caused the middle to fall apart? Moderate Republicans used to stand up against these forces, but they crumbled. And she gives the example that John Cornyn today, I have not seen this, so I'm taking Ann's word for it. John Cornyn today said he opposed Trump, but in private and not publicly. It was very brave, Jeff, very brave. Uh, Julian, you wrote a book on Newt Gingrich. Why don't, why don't you feel this one? Sure, look, I mean, my, my argument, and I, I spoke with all of you there uh, about a month ago or so about this, is that the party has been changing. And uh, the 2016 election really is, I think, a culmination of these changes that have taken place within the Republican Party. You've seen a sea change in the leadership. I, I argue Newt Gingrich uh, was really one of the pioneers of this new generation of, of partisanship, very intense partisanship as he came to power in the 1980s, but we've seen successive generations continue to move in that direction, certainly with the Tea Party, which is now the Freedom Caucus uh, during the Obama years. And I think the, the moderates are just not a very strong part of the party, uh, whether it's the changes in leadership or the demographic changes that made liberal Northeastern Republicans less relevant, what this all had add, added up to, and, and almost all of the social science agrees with this, that the Republican Party as a whole moved further to the right uh, than Democrats did to the left, and that it's much more unified as a party on that rightward part of the political spectrum. And, and you add to that a, a, a kind of information uh, news universe, uh, which is pretty formidable with stuff like Fox television. Uh, and so I think it's not that much of a surprise that the uh, complaints about what Trump says, what he does, or the way he practices politics are on a phone call uh, or, or in private. But when it comes to the vote, Republicans are very, very disciplined, loyal, and Trump is not so far off where I think most of the party is anymore. And that's the realization some Republicans are having, uh, like the George Conways or the Stuart Stevens, and some are leaving and others are gonna live with it and keep their comments uh, to, to the private, but, but it's not a small caucus. This is the Republican Party of 2020, and it's been in the making since the 80s. Kevin, you wanna jump in on that? No, I'm good. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, well, I'm gonna jump actually ahead to a related yep. question because I, I, it's important to know your audience, but it's also important to know your speakers. Uh, and uh, Bill Bush offers a question which actually begins with a compliment to you guys. So I thought I'd offer that which is that he says, I taught fault lines in my US history since 1945 class last fall, and it was very well received. I wonder if you think we're entering into a time of political realignment of some sort. In fact, I, if I could extend on that question, Julian, from what you were just saying, uh, if the Republican party is ideologically in line with Trump, does that mean that uh, Trump would be doing very well in this election were he not Trump? 
personally? Um, but he's still, look, within the Republican Party, he's still not collapsing. I mean, that's just not where the election is. I think there's the, the Democratic Party is just a lot bigger. And right now, in part because of Biden, but in large part because of the antipathy to President Trump, he's just drawing a lot of that Democratic and small independent support out, at least in the polling. Um, but, but a lot of the party is with Trump. The congressional Republicans that are as accurate a measure of anything of the party have stood by him 100%. There's been no dissension on almost any key issue. I'm even suspicious of some of the comments we hear now that this isn't positioning, uh, Republicans positioning yeah. themselves for a potential loss and their own kind of remaking, um, you know, uh, uh, SAS. Uh, ben Sass, you know, he said this in a call with many constituents, and he's a very, he knows what he's doing. So I don't really know what was going on with those comments. But Trump has done fine with the Republican Party. And the question is, though, how long can the Republican Party survive? Because it is a much smaller coalition, and it's depending on a lot of these other things, I think, at this point to win. It's not a broadening party. It's no longer that. I mean, Reagan was still broadening the party. I think Bush was trying to do it. Uh, we're not seeing that anymore. So the question is, does that peter out at some point? But it might not be for 10 years. Uh, and, and who knows what happens then? Maybe voters will kind of remake their identity at that point. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of this obviously is going to depend on, A, what happens in 2020, but then also what happens in the next two elections, in the midterms and in the 2024. The character of the Republican Party will be fought fiercely in those elections, especially in the presidential primaries of 2024. Uh, we're assuming here Trump goes down. Uh, part of it will depend on, on how big he goes down and how much of the party he takes with him um, and, and who emerges as, um, as a, a likely heir to Trumpism. There are certainly several candidates who are jockeying for that role. I think Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley are, uh, and Ted Cruz are really kind of pushing for that. There are others who are clearly sounding actually a lot like they sounded in the October 2016 when they thought Trump was going to lose, putting out notes of, of that they can come back to later on to point to to say, oh, I was I was secretly against him. I was plotting to bring him down from the inside. Uh, wink, wink. Uh, all that talk will be there. Um, so a lot of it's going to depend on really who reclaims uh, the, um, uh, the mantle here. I think long term, Julian's point is, is, is the important one, which is it'll probably change. We don't know quite when, but just demographically speaking, a party that has based its support on a group of older white voters, regionally bounded, uh, is not really set up for growth. And they have, uh, I think if we look back at what the Republican Party has done over the last 20 years, there were a couple off ramps there for the party to reinvent itself. Uh, and I think a lot of people tried to make that happen. If you look at, at under George W. Bush, um, uh, for all the, the, the flaws people may see with, with him on foreign affairs or the economy, or whatever, on the terms of widening the base of the party, he was serious about bringing in African-American and Hispanic conservatives and doing, I think, a very capable job of that. I, I think there was a, a plausible way in which the Obama candidacy in 2008 interrupted that, uh, but there was a po plausible path there for the Republican Party to expand its base in, in terms of, of class, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of region, in terms of generation, that Trump has one by one closed the door on over these four years, and I'm not sure they're going to go back. I mean, I think the most important bit of polling data we can look at right now is where are voters in the 18 to 29 age group going? And they are running away from the Republican Party as fast as they can. And if that political identity becomes set in stone as we know it does. We saw this during the Reagan revolution where younger voters went Republican and then stayed with that identity uh, throughout their voting life. If that happens now with a new generation being wedded to the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is e either shedding seniors through their policies or losing them uh, through the grim march of time, uh, that sets up to a disaster for them. So we don't have Okay. Let me just jump in. I mean, it's also very conceivable. I think the, what Kevin said that you need several losses is important. And people forget that 2008 was pretty devastating to the Republicans. And 
I, I, we were all three of us were probably on tons of panels. Is the conser is conservatism dead? Is the Republican Party over? Uh, I mean, Kevin and I were literally on a panel at Princeton about this with a group of conservatives, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and but but after Obama was elected, and that was a time of total failure for an administration with foreign policy, it was seen as a potential sea change. But the Republican Party moved, it kind of doubled down on right after that. Uh, so it, it didn't broaden itself very easily. That is the other way this goes. It's like, well, we have to be even more fierce and even more committed to the principles that, that we want to fight for. So I don't know. I think it could take a while till you see any real change within the party. Okay, so but let, me, let me spin back then to my 1896 example, because if in 2008, we were having a discussion, is conservatism and the Republican Party in trouble? Certainly, we know the Republican Party did their own self-examination and autopsy after 2012 that reached that demographic conclusion. Uh, if we've been arguing for multiple cycles now that time is not on the GOP side, does that make 2016 just an anomaly or? Yeah. Okay. I, I think so. I mean, I, I think you're going to look back at, and see both the, the, the kind of the, the freak bank shot that it took for Trump to win the presidency and the way in which a lot of those, uh, the, the Senate races broke in the last couple of weeks as the, 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 the Comey news and the butter email stuff took over. Um, I do think that's going to seem to be an anomaly. I mean, I, I think you can look back at the Obama years and, uh, and certainly the reaction to them is going to be the usual kind of retrenchment. But if you look at what happens in, in 2020 as part of a continuum with 2018 and perhaps a continuing wave in 2022, uh, then yeah, I think we will see the, 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 the sort of the, the tide turn here. So let's let's jump then to the other side of the ledger for a second. Uh, a question from uh, Chaluv Gidwandi, uh, who wants to talk about the Democrats. Uh, a lot has been made about how the American right got to this point in its history. And of course, he mentions that Ju Professor Zelzer has written an excellent book on the Gingrich revolution. Um, we'll talk about, we evaluate that sentence in a moment. Uh, but I'm curious to hear y'all's thought about the roots of how Joe Biden ended up the representative of the Democratic Party. What are the forces that made it a party focused on healthcare, the environment, and racial justice? And if the, those three are correct, why Biden? I mean, I can, I can offer a little speculation here on, on what might be going on. Um, you know, part of it is, and this is a difference with the two parties, the, the Democrats have not moved as a whole uh, to the left the same way Republicans have moved to the right, which means they've remained much more divided. And we keep seeing different elections where the divisions flare. We saw it in 1980 already with Ted Kennedy challenging Jimmy Carter as a centrist. You saw it certainly during Clinton's term with ongoing uh, kind of animosity from House Democrats like Dick Gephardt and others about policies from the administration. And so I think the party is more divided, still is after the 2018 midterm, as it's been pointed out many times, yes, you have the Progressive Caucus. You also have a large number of members in the House who are more centrist. And so Pelosi's constantly juggling all this. So, so there is a logic that would lead the party in the end to pick the person who can unite them, who seems the, the least um, problematic at some level to, to bring people together. And it's also the Democrats are still a very politically, ironically conservative party. I think in this age of polarization of the two parties, they're the ones that tend to act a little bit from fear. I think the Republicans uh, act much more forcefully. I, I have a quote in the Gingrich book from Steve Bannon, who says Republicans come for the head wound and Democrats come for a pillow fight. And, and I think that's part of what ended up uh, kind of leading to Biden. I think there's a lot of fear among Democratic voters and even um, candidates. Uh, what is it? Is it too much of a risk to go with someone like whether it's Sanders or uh, Warren or even some of the other candidates? Let's just go with safe. And I think that's very much in the party's DNA. So those are two of the things I think that went on. And look, the, the other part that I don't think got enough attention, which is the Biden claim, that in this election, the person matters. And 
you know, President Trump's kryptonite might be someone who's just pretty likable and humane. And he can't, whatever he throws, he can't undercut that. He doesn't exactly know how to do that and it's not working. And so on a positive side, maybe there was something, not to electability, but to that's the candidate for this election against this president that would be very powerful. Those are three ideas of the party. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with all that. I, I, I think the what's I think we have to uncouple the question. Uh, the the processes that led the Democratic Party to this point with those policies, I, I think, are, are are fairly obvious how they've, they've moved over that period. Biden isn't here because of those policies that the Democratic Party has embraced. Biden is here. Uh, largely because, as Julian noted, uh, uh, many voters in the Democratic base are small C, I guess it's always small C, but are, are politically conservative in their in their personality, not in their ideology, right? And so it was African-American voters in South Carolina, remember, that that shifted the conversation radically to, um, uh, uh, to Biden. I, I was in uh, uh, Austin in uh, uh, late February, right before the South Carolina, uh, a primary had I had uh, a breakfast with uh, a, a student I used to have who was a, a former uh, uh, member of Biden's staff who had written him off for dead. This is it, he's not going to go anywhere. And a week later, he's suddenly turned around. It was a South Carolina primary. They did it, and it was not because African American voters thought he was the best. They thought white voters in the general electorate apparently would like him the best and would feel the most comfortable with him. And they made that very kind of conservative approach. What's important to understand about Biden, both in terms of how he got here, and I think what's going to happen with this presidency, is if you look back on Joe Biden's um, uh, ideological placement for his entire run in the Senate, he is always, it's amazing, he is always dead center in the Democratic caucus. And so in the 70s, it's a little bit more over to the right. And then the 80s, it's about there. I mean, in the 90s, as the party moves left, Joe Biden is right in the middle with them, right? Which makes me think, in a lot of ways, he could be, you know, like an FDR, someone who comes in at a great moment of ideological fervor and a rising tide in his party, and really is swayed by where the party moves on certain issues, right? Uh, and so I, I think he's going to be amenable to those on the left who are worried about, you know, a Joe Biden presidency, you know, just following the footsteps of Obama. I think both his personality and the climate have changed, but importantly, the connection between those, Biden's personality in this climate will really matter. And he's gonna be pulled left, especially if voters on the left turn out and put candidates that they like and represent in Congress and the House to put pressure on him and his administration. And, I mean, and I think, I mean, he's already done that and you can see uh, just his own evolution since winning the primary. And there are a lot of issues where even though Democrats are divided, I think, broadly on the goal, they're not so far off. It's, it's really the means of how do you get to these objectives. The flip side for Democrats would be if it's like 1976, meaning uh, a moment where it seems the opposition's discredited. Democrats in 76 had the White House, they had House and Senate, and things didn't go well for the party. Uh, and, and that's also like part of this story that we don't know uh, how it's going to play out, but it will also depend these long-term changes. And is this a new coalition on how the Democrats would perform if they win, if they win? And we should keep saying that because you could envision a different scenario as well. Um, but that's tricky. We've had moments with, with huge opportunity for a party that, that falls apart and moves in the wrong direction. And I think as a president, he would have to juggle some of these tensions and questions about the particulars of policy that won't be easy. Um, so, so we would have to see how that goes. So let me bring these two responses together in a sense, because, you know, Kevin, you mentioned FDR. Uh, Julian, you mentioned uh, Democrats have a proclivity perhaps not to go for the kill shot. Uh, where that winds up, I think, is in one of the most contentious issues that we're going to face, I think, presumably, uh, in the next term, which is what to do with the Supreme Court size. Uh, I'm curious as both as historians and if you will, as pundit slash advisors, uh, if you think Biden is likely to try to go along with a move to pack the court, would you as a historian advise him to? Uh, and do you think that that would play out any different than Roosevelt in 1937? Yes, yes, and yes. 
All right. Uh, yes, I think Biden is warming to it. Uh, I think he's very much an institutionalist. He raps, you know, rhapsodical about the, about the Senate traditions. Probably feels the same way about the Supreme Court. But I think he has come to realize, or at least have enough advisors telling him, uh, that court packing needs to be on the table. Uh, the way he, he, if he'd been, we asked this question last year, batted it down out of hand. Uh, now he's much more amenable to it. He's been a little coyer with it. In fact, he's pointing out, I think rightfully, the way Democrats never have, what conservatives have done with not just the Supreme Court, but with the lower federal courts. He's really made that an issue. So yes, I think he's more amenable to it. Uh, the impetus for this, of course, is gonna come from Congress. Uh, the president will, you know, if he's a new president, will, will throw out a plan probably, but it's got to take Congress to do it. And I think the will is there. And if they pass a bill and send it to his desk, I think Biden would have a very easy way to say, well, this is what you people want. I'd be happy to nominate some more justices. Um, will it play out uh, differently this time? I think absolutely. Uh, you know, I, so I teach the mid 20th century and I cover court packing every year. And one of the things I have to stress to my students is that you can't understand court packing unless you understand how radically different the conception of its politicization was in the period. Uh, the, the Supreme Court certainly was political, but when FDR unveiled the court packing plan, first of all, it was done stupidly, right? The court packing plan itself was not an argument that these justices aren't listening to the will of the people. It wasn't any kind of judicial restraint argument. It was a Rube Goldberg machine about when a justice hits a certain age, they, they get incapacitated. And if they wait six months beyond that point to retire, I could appoint another justice to sit alongside them. It was just too complicated and it was too cute by half. Mm -hmm. If the Democrats come out and say, look, these were illegitimate appointments and we're just gonna write the, the ship or make a more process or argument of when we had nine justices, it was because we had nine circuits and now we have more than that, we should have more justices. There are easier ways to do this. So they can make the case easier. But the key point again is that the public was shocked that FDR would dare to bring politics onto the court. No one out there with a pulse is going to think the court is currently not engaged in politics, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's much less of a blowback if Democrats were to push this issue now than if they were to push it than when they pushed it in 37, when it seemed like FDR was starting a fight rather than finishing it. Uh, and should they do it? Yeah, they should do it. Uh, because if they don't, Anything that Biden, they could have the House, the Senate, the White House, they could pass a raft of New Deal style, Great Society style legislation in two years. It could be one of the most successful swaths of, of legislative history. And yet it could all get struck down by a 6-3 court uh, in no time, uh, which is what led them to court packing in the New Deal era. So I think there are enough people here who know to get ahead of that. They need to move on issues like voting rights. They need to move on issues like uh, uh, adding new states uh, long overdue. They need to move on institutional reforms like the filibuster and they need to move on the Supreme Court. Julie, you want I think, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I have less certainty A about um, how this will play out. Uh, I do think, and, and I believe that what President Trump has done now with the Supreme Court is a, a dramatic change we've just seen. And so it is setting the conversation. I mean, this is like an Earl Warren court, I've said, for the right. And it's with young justices. Uh, and I think Democrats are really feeling defeated in many ways about what's happened and, and changing it through the processes we have is gonna be very hard. So there's a lot of incentive for Democrats to think outside of that. And, and the, the most uh, apparent choice right now is, is that. And I think there's lots of arguments to be made that you can do it. I think we did it. The Supreme Court doesn't have a set number. It did change size. And, and you've seen under the Senate Republicans, the willingness to do all sorts of things to break precedent and norms. So why shouldn't they be able to do that? I do think the, I think, I guess the pushback would still be fierce, not because of anything Kevin said is wrong, but Republicans are ready to be, to, to kind of create a, a, a backlash about anything, uh, to whip up a frenzy at sure. just oh, yeah. about anything. We've seen like the smallest thing. Yeah. If, if Joe Biden drops a pen, I would imagine there'd be 24 hours of politicians on news saying this is the biggest scandal we've seen in the 20th century and 21st century. Um, and, and this is already, as you see in the campaign, an issue they're gearing up to do. 
the bigger question is, as with everything, this is going to be a cleanup presidency. And it's a part of a Biden challenge would be, how do you clean up all the mess that he's inheriting? And that takes a lot of um, political energy and political capital. And so what you would see is an administration balancing that with some of these other proposals. You'd have to have filibuster reform in the mix too, uh, if, if you're gonna go in this direction. And I don't know where Democrats would be come January uh, and February of, of 2021, when they're still dealing with, we'll see how the, the state of the nation is at this point. So that's the question. Uh, the, the, the other, I think, issue they have to think about, Republicans have been very good about this long-term court strategy that started in the 80s in terms of the federal society and creating networks of conservative justices and really thinking 20, 30 years ahead. There's a great book by Steve Tellis on this, and the one thing Democrats can't afford is putting everything in this and not really thinking through what is the judicial strategy for the party, for liberals, that might end up accomplishing what conservatives have done very well um, with the judiciary. And, and I think it would be a mistake only to go in that one direction. But again, uh, if, if President Trump wins, we're looking at a conservative court that will be even stronger probably uh, by the end of his second term. So that's the other possibility here. So let me throw not so much an alternative hypothesis at you guys about the court, but rather an alternative scenario, uh, which is that we remember that the standard interpretation for 1937 is that, uh, you know, a switch in time save nine, that the court recognized that it was imperiled at number nine if it was continuing to go against public will. So made some decisions that went along with public will to diffuse the anger against the court. Uh, Justice Roberts, we've already seen, has a, a willingness to interpret laws with the court's legitimacy, I think, in the back of his mind. Uh, is there anything to suggest into your mind that uh, somebody of the, one of the new justices perhaps might join with Roberts and decide that we need to uh, give the Democrats some wins for, for, for a couple of years, lest they come for our heads? Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, um, if you look back to court packing, you know, the switch in time that saves nine is, is when, for those of you who don't know it, um, I won't go too deep in the weeds, but it's Justice Owen Roberts, uh, a different Justice Roberts, uh, was the swing vote on that court. And uh, it puzzled people at the time because the switch was that he had voted uh, to strike down a state minimum wage law in New York. And then shortly later, voted to uphold a state minimum wage law in Washington. And it seemed absurd to people that he'd done this. There are reasons he did this. But the timing of it is important because the timing apparently is uh, in December 1936, Chief Justice uh, Charles Evans Hughes, who'd been the Republican nominee in 1916, someone who knew politics, looked at the election returns of the landslide victory that FDR had just taken and pulled Roberts in and, and had a chat with him and basically said that, Jeff, said, all right, the, the people have spoken we need to start giving the New Deal a little more leeway. And so in the initial vote for that, that Washington State minimum wage case, Roberts announced he was gonna switch. And, and from that point on, it was clear the tide had turned. So is somebody gonna do that? We have a chief justice who I think will think about the legitimacy of the court and the election returns. Who that person would be? Um, you know, people who yell at their screens, but I think Neil Gorsuch, could be, if I had to pick one person out of this bench, I think they're all very unlikely, but Gorsuch has already shown a willingness to break with conservative orthodoxy on certain issues. The, the Native American rights cases, he's, he's done this on. Uh, and I could see him feeling that his own uh, legitimacy as the first Trump justice uh, and the one occupying Merrick Garland's seat is at stake here. And he might be persuaded uh, to shift, who knows? You could also see a scenario in which, you know, justices have been hounded off the bench before. Abe Fortas, who, uh, you know, Julian uh, knows the story very well, uh, was in line to be elevated to replace Earl Warren. And basically through Senate hearings and investigations into his past, not only didn't get that a promotion, but stepped off the court entirely. So you could see uh, there are rumors about Justice Kavanaugh's uh, financial dealings. You could see those investigated by Democratic Senate, which leads to his, you know, impeachment or, or resignation. Possible. Again, none of this is likely, but, but as long as we're spitballing here. Or the other way, meaning I think that's a good point in that 
Um, you could also imagine Republicans in the Senate making it clear that the justices have to not do stuff like that because <laughs> they also can launch those kinds of accusations and are very willing to do so. And Senator McConnell would not uh, be hesitant if someone was really off-roading it on the court. And um, so, so I think the political pressure does matter. I, I do think Roberts has concern. It seems pretty clear. I don't know how many times though, he's actually willing to switch to the liberal, it's not even, you know, to the liberal very minority at this point. Yeah. And you need another person. So it's not one person. You're going to need uh, more than one on these votes. And that's going to be hard to do. And all of the new justices are part of this generation we've been talking about. They've come up through this federal society, federal society circles. They are really uh, nurtured in this way in thinking. And, and I think, sure, there might be moments they're worried about this, that there is a lot of heat to expand the court. They might shift a little bit. But I don't know if they'd go so far. I think they are committed to uh, a, a kind of judicial revolution now with this court. And I don't think they're going to stop easily on a lot of issues from voting rights uh, to reproductive rights. I think there might be uh, one offs uh, like Roberts and the Louisiana case, for example. But I don't think you're going to get enough votes now uh, on a lot of issues. I, I think this is a rightward court. And uh, either expansion happens and works or it doesn't. Um, or, you know, the Democrats will have to work around the court if, if they have power uh, through legislation and continue to challenge the court, essentially, as an institution uh, through their own power. So uh, this has been great. We're, we're coming up on the end of time, but I'm going to keep you guys for a few extra moments because we had started a few extra moments uh, late. And so I was thinking, actually, we could go next to kind of a speed round. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, questions that we've been offered. So uh, just, you know, you, kind of your first reactions on these questions. Uh, first, from Michael Rudder, is the high early voter turnout a more positive sign for one side or the other? Yes, Democrats. Julian? Agreed. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> you don't have to be quite so fast. You know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, from what we know, yes. That's <laughs> the uh, Sarah McNamara wants to know, uh, I love this question because we're never getting out of speed around with this question. Uh, abolishing the Electoral College, good or bad? Good, but hard. Yeah, and it's been tried before, uh, even in the 70s, and it's a very difficult issue to move. That's even harder than moving some kind of court expansion. Uh, this is a fundamental change. And I, I can't I can't see that happening right now, even if this election replicates some of the imbalances we've seen. So I'm going to pull my own historical reference and pull a Jesse Jackson here and say the question is moot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for laughing, because uh, the real question, it seems to me, is not the Electoral College. It's the Senate that yeah. you, you want to talk about undemocratic institutions. Why are we worrying about the one that acts every four years as opposed to the one that acts every day? with the caveat, of course, that that's even harder to change than the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my own speed round answer. We'll move yeah. ahead. Uh, here's a good question uh, from Ranjana Murthy. Has there ever been a president that held a previous president and administration to account for crimes and corruption? And if not, is that possible if Joe Biden wins? Most of the big waves of corruption have been swept away. Right. Um, uh, so the Harding administration, tons of corruption. Those people went to jail. Fine. But it wasn't really because of the next administration. That was Calvin Coolidge. Um, uh, Nixon pardoned. A lot of his men went to jail. Um, uh, usually in the past, presidents have wanted to look the other way. But Julian and I have written about this separately and together that we think that's a mistake. Uh, I, I think we would both agree uh, that uh, Ford's pardon of Nixon was, uh, I think he sincerely thought it was in the country's best interest, mm -hmm. uh, but it certainly wasn't in the country's best interest long term because it set a pattern, uh, both in terms of Nixon's insistence, which Trump and others before him picked up, if a president does it, it's not illegal. Uh, but it also set up uh, the idea that these pardons would be a get out of jail free card. And we certainly saw that with George H.W. Bush and Iran Contra. Um, uh, we, we've seen uh, the pardon power used to lesser event. And, and people from those scandals have come back in this presidency. 
Uh, and so I, I think that's a lesson that we, we need greater accountability. And I think with this administration, I mean, it might be settled, that might be settled in the courts at this point, which I'm sure is something the president fears the minute he, he leaves office. Um, but we're talking about um, levels of corruption and misuse of power that is truly historic and precedent setting. And so it's not simply should another president, whether it's in 2021 or 2025, whenever that is, should they hold them accountable? Is it good for the presidency? But it's what kind of precedents are you basically accepting? If nothing happens when this presidency ends, whenever that is, just at the level of conflict of interest, we have now accepted massive conflict of interest as a normal and acceptable part of how the White House operates. And I think that's a problem as a historian. And so I would hope that uh, a future president would really in some ways, uh, not only look at that, but be open to holding people accountable if, yeah. if laws were broken, if rules were broken. And another quick point on that is that the um, a lot of Trump's vulnerabilities and apparent legal liabilities that are going to be coming due as soon as he's out of office aren't ones that are going to be inflicted by the a presidential administration or even Congress. It's the state attorney general in New York or the DA in, in New York City where he's got a lot of these businesses. Those people are the people who are going to be coming after him. And the pardon power does nothing to protect him there anyway. And in some ways, Biden wouldn't even have to get his hands dirty with this because there are other people who are already in line with, with real cases to make. Although that's, that's actually the scenario that concerns me the most because that would suggest uh, that we have a president held to account for his actions, but without essentially the national referendum decision that that's what we need to do. It, it, I mean, I think that scenario, which I think is also the most likely, feeds into the QAnon world that, you know, there is a, a deep state here that's out to get, get mm -hmm. our guy at every level. So um, that's the only mention we're gonna have of QAnon, I hope. Uh, so n next question. Uh, I should warn you, this is from uh, Carolyn Brittell, who is the head of Denman College's Interdisciplinary Center. So please answer along multiple axes of analysis, if you would. Uh, have we ever had a president, uh, presidential candidate in the past who lied so much? And I will note, Carolyn did not suggest which one she was referring to. Well, very fair. Um, uh, no, we've not had a presidential candidate uh, who lied as much as one of these two presidential candidates. Um, uh, Nixon didn't lie this much. Um, I can't think of anyone who uh, had less regard for truth. I mean, it's and it's in a way his strategy is it's just a fire hose of lies. And so anyone that gets spewed, you know, if, if there were a candidate who had one of these lies and that was it, and you could pick any of them, that would dominate news coverage for weeks and weeks. That would be we would talk about that as a scandal. There are you watch someone like Daniel Dale who on CNN who facts checks uh, uh, Trump. And it's just hundreds in a speech, uh, you know, it, and so it just, it just comes out where none of them can really resonate with the fact checkers uh, trying to hold them accountable. And so they all slip by. Yeah, I mean, it's like, look, it's scale and scope really matters. And it's often hard to convey that. Uh, candidates have lied, presidents have lied, almost all of them. True, all true. It's not the first of this. But what you're seeing is it's again, it's this normalization term, which I think is actually useful in that it's, it's incessant, uh, that a majority of a lot of what he says, it's not even close, it's not even twisting things a little bit. He's willing, and, and at some level, I think he would acknowledge this, to just say whatever he wants to say. That is presidential power under President Trump, the ability and willingness to say whatever you wanna say. And I think that's just categorically different. And uh, he's done it during his presidency too. And now I think there's a world of communication that makes it uh, even more plausible to do that. It's easier to get away with it. Uh, sure, you have fact checkers, but you also have networks and online publications and social media that will uh, get this out quickly and, and uh, with certainty and make it impossible uh, to retract. So I, th I think it's fair to uh, say that one candidate is is acting that way, um, and and that is different than what we've seen. Well, I wonder if if when we look back on this historically, if that isn't going to be the way in which we understand this election, the 2020 cycle, 
most broadly that yes, there's a pandemic, yes, there's an economic crisis, et cetera, et cetera, but that none of the president's attacks can work because he's already demonstrated that nobody should believe anything he says. Yeah. Uh, no matter how true they are. So, uh, or not. Um, two or more not. questions for you guys, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. The first is, um, I'm gonna twist the question a little bit. Uh, what do you think is the most likely scenario for how things work out after the election? And the way I want to twist this is let's presuppose a Biden victory. What do you think is the most likely scenario? And I would please urge you to reinforce how strange it is that we have to ask that question. Yeah, I, I think it depends on assuming a Biden victory and it's not assumed. Please go vote. Assuming a Biden victory. Um, I think it entirely depends on the size of the victory. If it's a close one, if, 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 if it's clear Trump loss, but it's a five, six point loss, something maybe even larger than that, it's respectable enough. Um, uh, I, I think you could see Trump uh, uh, go kicking and screaming, uh, maybe not a lot of formal complaints. There will definitely be a lot of complaining in public that he was, it was, it was robbed. I mean, we saw this in 2016, he won and complained, but there were three to 5 million illegal uh, uh, voters, right? In a winning election. Imagine if he loses by that, that same margin, the complaints will be even more so. And that, but I don't think they're gonna be extended, uh, knock wood, I don't think there would be extended legal challenges in that case, but I do think you would see Trump go on to use this as a springboard for Trump TV or, or you know, um, a, a Vegas residency where he relitigates the 2016 campaign, uh, you know, uh, over and over again. Uh, if it's a blowout win, uh, I do think that all this bluster just falls apart. And I think Trump just slinks away and uh, grumbling again, but that's it. Uh, the real nightmare is if it's a squeaker. Um, and we wouldn't see you know, in 1960, it was incredibly close, and the Nixon campaign had every reason to believe that there were Democratic shenanigans in, in Illinois and other states. And they started to, to think about this. In Nixon's bio, he says, oh, I, you know, I, I didn't think about this at all. No, they're thinking about it on the ground, and they have field agents out in, I think, nine states. But ultimately, he calls it off, right? If Trump's in that scenario, he will not call it off. They will exhaust every last option in terms of not just partisans on the ground, uh, people who are who are uh, doing extra legal activity, shall we say, but also in terms of the courts, in terms of Congress, and definitely in terms of the media ecosystem on the right. It will be full, full, uh, full Blair on that. Sorry, the coffee just wore off, apparently. It'll be full <laughs> Blair on that point, and they will go all in. So I really do think the size of this election uh, result would really matter. Uh, a narrow Biden win uh, is in many ways a nightmare scenario for the country uh, because it'll lead to something that would make the 2000 recount uh, look like child's play. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with any of that. And um, I mean, look, there's there are mechanisms in a lot of states, you don't just get a recount. Uh, so, so there has to be a narrowness really of, of the victory. So that's really going to be the issue. But if this is narrow, and it could very well be narrow, this, uh, if, if it plays out like other elections, it's gonna be uh, a pretty brutal um, few weeks. And I can imagine whatever the actual outcome is, President Trump wins um, because he just has a lot of resources at his disposal in that particular scenario. And, uh, and so the size will matter, not for any mandate. It will literally matter that it's just too much to overcome through the various stages of legal challenges that have to be undertaken. A lot of these states, though, they have Republican Supreme Courts right now. They have very conservative legislatures, a lot of these swing states. So um, I think the administration is well aware of that. And look, they already have a team that's being funded to prepare for a massive legal challenge. These, someone asked earlier, it, what, the first question, I'm, I'm forgetting the name, I'm sorry, that uh, high number of absentee ballots, is that good for the Democrats? Well, yes, if they're processed. Um, but we can't discount the idea there'll be shenanigans with that at this point. Everything should be considered on the table or you really haven't been paying attention to what's been going on. So uh, I think the Democrats need a pretty sizable win to make this a kind of clean month 
uh, moving into a transition, uh, if they can do that. Well, gents, this, this has been absolutely wonderful. I'm going to get you out of here on this one. Uh, I'm we glad have, we can leave on such a happy note. You're welcome, everyone. Yeah. Uh, well, I can tell you the score of the game. That might, you know. No, I peaked. We won. That's great. I, I figured you did. Uh, <laughs> multitasking, my name is Kevin. Um, so uh, we're all, I'm going to use the word condemned, uh, the three of us, to write about this period for the rest of our lives. Yep. When you write the history of this era that we are in now, or even just the, this 2020, or even the Trump presidency, what's the first line of your paragraph? I swear to God, this all happened. <laughs> That's good. For me, it would be President Trump is the product of many decades of, you know, how the Republicans have changed. Fine, Not I'll take the point. rewrite. That's fine. I think for me, that's just a fundamental point uh, to understand right now. Yeah. Or then, if not, we're missing. And I, I almost wouldn't want to make him the center of the first line because then we miss how this all came together. That's interesting because honestly, I would have gone the exact opposite direction and said that uh, my first line would be it was a four year anomaly. Uh, that it's not the trends that produced him that are important. It's the trends that uh, he was the last gasp of that, that are critical. And maybe that's the same. We're going to have competing books. Uh, yes. I think um, we got to have another Zoom. I, what, what worries me is knowing your record, you'll probably have the book out in 10 minutes. So. <laughs> He's writing it right now, Jeff. <laughs> even though we go. Well, guys, this has been absolutely a pleasure. Uh, thank you both, Julian, Kevin. Uh, it's been great. And we look forward to having you back to SMU when we can all travel so we can all you know hit the barbecue and text next. Amen. Amen. Perfect. Uh, thank, thank you. Jeff. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everybody. And thank you all for tuning in. Go vote. Go, yeah, vote. go vote, everyone. And listen to the podcast. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Okay, good night.